Hi, I'm Stefan Tornquist. And I'm Rick Bruner. Welcome to the second episode of our podcast, Measured Response. The podcast is a function of the research wants, a forum for folks who are in digital analytics, uh, marketing measurement, and data science. Uh, everybody who lives and breathes measurement. If you want to be part of the conversation, come to researchwonks.com and, uh, and join the membership. Now, this month's episode is brought to you by Standard Media Index. SMI is the industry's trusted source for ad spending and pricing intelligence. Rick, tell us about the episode today. Yeah, well, today's episode is a really exciting one that we think is going to exemplify what we're trying to do with this podcast. We've got a couple of great guests that have been in this industry for many years and have a great perspective on where we've been and where we're going, namely Mainak Mazumdar, who is Chief Research and Data Officer of Nielsen, a company many people have heard of, and Nancy Smith, who is Founder and President and CEO of Analytic Partners, which is celebrating its 20-year anniversary right now, and in that time has grown into a real powerhouse globally of helping marketers understand marketing ROI. So with that, we're going to jump straight into that conversation. We're joined by our guests, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves because they're going to do a much better job. Nancy, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Stefan. Nancy Smith with Analytic Partners here. Uh, Analytic Partners turns data into expertise so that our clients can get closer connections with their customers and deliver growth. Uh, I founded Analytic Partners just over 20 years ago uh, and delighted to be here. I'm Mainak Mizumdar. I'm with Nielsen Company. I, um, I'm the chief data and research officer, which means that I run the data science and the data organization in the company. And uh, as you guys know, Nielsen um, measures media and we love doing this. I've been doing this for 20 plus years. I'm excited about this, about this discussion. Both Nancy and I look forward to have a good chat with you folks. Absolutely. That's All great. Right. Well, we're so happy to have you. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk about. We thought we'd use this episode, our second in our podcast series, and with uh, the two of you esteemed guests who have been, you know, as you've said, at least 20 plus years looking at advertising, digital and otherwise, uh, uh, well, all forms of media, television, certainly, uh, in uh, performance context and in the whole measurement of media and advertising for lo these many years. And our podcast is really meant to focus on that measurement question. And a lot is going on in this space right now. All four of us have been in the sector for that amount of time. And I, I take note that this is the 30th anniversary year from that very prophetic first banner ad or it gets credited as being the first banner ad from at and uh, that had the great copy, have you ever clicked your mouse right here? You will. 30 years later, we invented ad tech in that time, and then we reinvented it as programmatic, and now we're re-reinventing it, you know, in the coming countdown sunset of cookies. We have these practices, both of you have a lot of experience with, of multi-touch attribution, MTA, and market mix models, MMM, which are both very mature practices for analyzing media performance. And there's a lot of discussion in the industry about how they adapt to uh, where the industry is moving and maybe you know some innovations that are coming uh, in their wake. The, we have big industry initiatives going on with the World Federation of Advertisers setting global cross media definitions for impression delivery and reach and frequency counting. And then the Media Ratings Council, the MRC is currently doing a big initiative on outcome measurements for advertising. Privacy is roiling a lot of these changes and, and really holding questions as to what the future is for addressability of targeting and of measurement. Uh, there's a big push for better data quality, something I know Linak is close to your heart, we're gonna come back to. 
And then, uh, you know, on my knock, you represent one of these companies and it's a big public company. So there's only so much you can say, but, you know, I just take note also that some of these big companies that have guided us for decades, Nielsen, Comscore, Antar, uh, GFK have also gone through big kind of restructurings of different types. And at a 30,000 foot view, there's a lot to talk about. And, and we're gonna unpack a lot of these issues in future podcasts in more detail with some other guests as well. But I thought, you know, since you guys uh, represent uh, many, many advertisers, points of view, media companies, and so on and so forth, uh, what do you make of, you know, it's what an interesting time to be alive, right? But I, I've never been bored in this industry, but it just feels like more than ever. And I don't know, am I wrong? Or is this really a moment we're having? It's a moment. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I like to say disruption is here and it's here, here to stay. Uh, and it's happened to so many industries through technology over the years. But in our industry, it's even more so given data deprecation, which I think you just you just touched on. Um, and it's upending how we're connecting with customers, consumers today, and measurement needs to evolve. And we're seeing that happen. Yeah, I think Nancy is right, uh, Rick, that there's a lot of disruption happening, but I think what we are seeing is acceleration of it. It's, uh, mm -hmm. things have been disrupted, you know, as you mentioned, you know, hardwired that ad, I remember that 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 AT and T ad was uh, first ran on a hardwired website, and Rex Briggs was I think was involved. Um, it's 1996, 1996 or 1997. I was in the West Coast at that point, mm -hmm. but I think the way at the speed at at which the disruption is happening has been uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting. And uh, and I'm, I would just point. I think you did a good summary. I would say maybe there are three, maybe four things that has been changing our business. And when I talk about our business, measurement business as a industry, first is technology. I do believe that uh, historically, you know, research confirms have been a um, little bit slower to adapt the new platforms, the new tech stack. And I think that has accelerated maybe Nancy in your organization as well uh, because of a lot a vast amount of data that we are processing and so on and so forth. As the last ten years, the second piece is the talent, right? In the historically, as a research, you know, the talent always have been survey sampling, statistical. Now, slowly, that's moving into more of computational, and uh, and that's been the trend, and increasingly trend. Not that the statistical and sampling those are not important, but we are kind of forced to embrace different techniques, different processing pipelines, and so on and so forth. And the third piece I would say is the data itself. It's interesting, maybe this is not true for Nancy, but it's true for us. We always collected our own data, right? We went into the field, we built panels, we talked to consumers, we put our own tags on, uh, you know, on ads, and uh, and so we had the census data and the panel data. But we realized maybe about ten years back that this is a team sport. Now we are kind of incorporating other data sources into the measurement in a set top box, smart TV, location data, logs, and so on and so forth. And all these th three things have accelerated, I would say. But what has not changed, at least in my part of the world, is the desire for quality. And I think that's, that has not only remained the same, I think it's also increasing more and more. And I think that's what kind of you, you're echoing some of those sentiments. The importance of quality and accountability is even greater now than ever before, because while it was simple and you, you know, MTA or attribution, you say something, but now there are a lot of competitive ways to look at it. And I'm pretty sure Nancy has some interesting <laughs> stories there as well. So I think the quality is taking the front and center. It's, it's exciting. Yeah, I would say that, that very true quality has always been and continues to be important. Um, one thing I would add that's increasing in importance today, given the acceleration is speed. Um, and sometimes their speed, cost, and quality can't have all three. You know, there's that 
mm. like a triangle there. Uh, but speed is something that we've seen in terms of need from our clients increase. And you know, clients who have had MTA solutions in place have found that the data quality is not there. And you know, that's with before the cookie's gone. Right. And, and if the data quality is not there, you spend all your time trying to get the data right. And you spend all this time data wrangling and you don't get to the insight, you don't get to the outcomes. Um, so we've had clients come on board for more of a unified measurement approach and really focus on outcomes and focus on speed, focus on live modeling. What can I do today for these decisions and start with the decision that you're looking to make. So kind of that forward looking decisioning and focus on the data that you need to make that decision as opposed to let me just marry all this data together um, because that's what I want to do and let you know the, the experts uh, handle the data uh, like yourselves, Minak and at Nielsen. Well, let's let's go to attribution. Nancy, you were writing uh, about um, some of the, the 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 challenges of data deprecation and the the opportunities. Why don't you pull out of there what you what you see as like this is what we ought to be excited about as the cookie disappears. Uh, where where does that you talked about the quality of the relationship with the customer? Where does that really come from at scale? I think you know the biggest challenge with cookie deprecation is there isn't a scaled solution. Um, so what that really means is those first party data assets, those customers that you have as a brand are gonna be all the more important for you to nurture and maintain and in a privacy safe, transparent manner with that value exchange. I think we as consumers are a little bit challenged between all this information at our fingertips um, and that access to information, yet we're bombarded um, and we want, we have a desire for simplicity. So it's that kind of natural tension that we're dealing with, but we're more than happy to give information in exchange for value. And, and that in its simplest form is how I think many marketers are looking to grow their first party data assets. Um, I've heard uh, many times over the past years that data is the new oil, right? You know, it's, in, in its raw form, it doesn't have value, but when you can put it together, um, it can truly be monetized um, for great worth. And I think marketers with first party data assets realize that, um, and they're looking to grow their first party data assets so that they can maintain and grow those connections with their customers. As, as uh, sort of easy access through third parties goes away, First party data just doesn't cut it for a lot of different kinds of company. Um, you know, okay. what, is the, what is the future of audience modeling or you know, are we gonna be, well, you, you tell well, me. So, so just, just wanna put one thing out there. People-based marketing doesn't equal, doesn't necessitate people-based measurement. So th that's, you know, they're not one in the same. You can measure your outcomes, not at the person level. As a matter of fact, in many cases you cannot legally do that anymore. So uh, you can truly understand if your campaigns are effective and achieving the goals that you want without that person level data. Um, so, but in terms of serving ads, there's a whole host of ways I think that will grow. Contextual targeting is one of them. Um, combining first party data and second party data. So publishers have second party data that they can combine with first party data will be another one. Um, and What's super exciting in this space for the future is all the new ways that we can experiment in terms of how we can reach our customers and understand, are we doing that? Are we reaching that right person at the right place um, with the right message? Because that's the key. Yeah, so let me add a couple of things that Nancy said. This is an important topic. Um, I think um, it is important that what Nancy mentioned that you know the measurement versus uh, outcomes the you you have, you have a potential opportunity to do the things differently and historically you know we have done that right so for cpg household is a consumption unit not a person although you're measuring your tv and ads on a personal level demographics but when you're looking at consumption as an unit is a household right and then or it's a store level data so i think there are good models out there but uh, uh, you know we feel that uh, with the uh, cookies going away, and I, you know, and a lot of us felt, and I, again, even during my days at DoubleClick, and Rick, you have been there since I've been after I left. 
you know, it's, we always felt third party cookie was great, but it's also a hack. <laughs> And uh, and I, I think you know it, over time um, you know that's going away is actually give, is going to give some clarity in terms of measurement and analytics, and I think we are in the zone where we're trying to find that clarity. Not yet. I, yeah, I do believe that the identity graph is going to play a role. Uh, as you know, a lot of companies have st- you know have had those graphs, right? Especially in the digital uh, ad tech perspective. But we believe that, um, as as well in measurement, we believe that there has to be a role for identity, ID graphs, because it does allow you to start linking uh, devices to a person, either real or synthetic persons. So there are some techniques I think a lot of people are working on. It's a really exciting field, by the way. (laughs) And, uh, And once you have a panel, then you can start calibrating and validating the graphs in a way that is very transparent and open. And I'm talking about measurement perspective, not for targeting. I think what Nancy is rightly talking about targeting because there are some interesting uh, possibilities there. So we feel that this transition to graph and first party onboarding is going to create some interesting you know, lanes for measurement as well as attribution. But uh, this is going to evolve. You know, it's, a, it's a start. Yeah, and I think that- was a, That was surprised, Nancy, when you said that you know, the, uh, the addressability and targeting, you know, we may be able to preserve, but I mean, how, how, how do you see solving the outcome problem with, you know, if there is not the deterministic level of identity? Outcomes are, don't need to be measured at the user level. Okay, well, can you elaborate on that? I mean, to, you know, from an ROI, how you actually know what channel is working. Sure. I mean, there's, 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 scenario there's, use case whole, there's a whole host of, of, you know, measurement techniques. Multi-touch attribution is built down at the user level. Typically, um, we have a solution called touchpoint analytics because I felt like multi-touch attribution really speaks to all the touches and you're really only looking at a few given the unaddressability of so much and the cookie deprecating. Um, but touch point analytics will exist in, in those small panels or in a smaller subset or in, certainly in some use cases and outcomes will be measured at that, could be measured at that level, probability to convert. Um, however, you can also look at layers above that. So you can look at cohorts, you can look at segments, you can look at uh, geographies. Geographies are absolutely critical, uh, particularly in this Error that we're in right now where mobility is challenged due to the pandemic. Uh, It's really important for retailers that have both a brick and mortar and and an e-commerce or even just a brick and mortar presence to understand how mobility is affecting their their foot traffic and therefore their sales. Um, And having data at that level of granularity and measuring the effectiveness of your campaigns in terms of the impact on that foot traffic Um, in that given day for that specific cohort or just in that specific day or week is is something that can be done, is done um, and done very uh, well given analytic methods today, provided you have the right quality data, um, which does exist. Well, the quality data question, uh, you know, is an opportunity to talk about your TED talk, Minoc. you know, one of the things I know your your role includes uh, is it does it have AI or machine learning in your title? I know that's one of your specialties there. You know, I, I often hear people assuming that AI, you know, throwing around the terms AI and machine learning like they are a solution in and of themselves. And you unpack, you know, how from the the U.S. Census, but by extension. Uh, a number of applications of, you know, the kind of data analytics we're doing depend on the most granular level of data in accuracy. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing any justice. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's there. Yeah, I know it's, it's, look, I'm I'm very passionate about this topic and uh, and also, you know, Nielsen is very important, you know, plays an important role in the data. 
I think if you think about it, you know, we, we have been um, deploying machine learning now for three years, um, but we have been at it actually for longer than that. It takes a little bit of time to deploy this into the production pipeline and platform because of MRC and audits, so you have to kind of explain and go through the process. But what we have found is that the data or the ground truth data that you use to train is as important as algorithm. And if I take a step back and if I look at this field for last maybe 20, 30 years, especially at least for media and marketing, you know, people talk a lot about investment in terms of computing, you know, computation power, big data, I can scale and I can pick, you know, crunch a massive amount of data through computation and get a result. So a lot of the investments has gone towards computation and algorithm and the less on actually collecting the data or building data infrastructure that allows you to you know, curate uh, better data sources and collect better ground truth so you could train them and obviously you know, have a better outcome in the results. For our perspective from Nielsen, you know, we, we, this has been our DNA for, for a long time. As you know, if you get selected in the sample, it does not matter. We make every attempt to recruit that home. In fact, we have uh, this whole algorithm called basic to alternate. So there are nine different alternates, right? Even if it is trailer park, we, we wanna make sure we go in and convert that as a panelist because that particular home in a sample is as important as anything because it's representative. You know, We represent minorities, ethnic population by geography, by age and gender. So that data set is very so, so important and, uh, and to your reference of the census, that's built off the framework of census, right? So this is, that's why I call data infrastructure. You start with census, build a ground truth, and then you use that for training other data sources. I think increasingly we see a lot of this, and this has been, especially in the ad tech marketing, people just use data that's available to them and they've collected for some other purposes. Right, so you collect the data because of you've targeted something and you take that and you put it into an algorithm and come up with an outcome. Now, a lot of times it works, but if you are making a decision, um, you know, millions of decision on buying and selling the way our data gets used, we feel that the quality of the data has to be, you know, takes a priority. So we're very passionate about that. And I, I think we need to focus on the data as much as we do on the computation and algorithm when it comes to the machine learning. I couldn't agree more, Minak. Uh, the data is absolutely critical. And uh, if you're making decisions on that data, even more so. Uh, so having that right training set is, is absolutely key. I, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, we take a lot of time uh, and pride in our data assessment process for that very reason to ensure that on the other side, the analytics are going to be robust, but then we can validate from a decisioning standpoint as well. Um, so that data part, it's also oftentimes um, when we go into a analytics, an analytic program with a, with a client, it's also a bit daunting for clients because it is pulling together a lot of their, their data um, and data that's often readily available, but it's really important to get that set and right. And once it is, uh, it's, you can have, you know, great things can happen. So that's, that's, that's where the fun begins. <laughs> but I, I'm excited for AI actually um, in, in terms of what it's done for our lives and, you know, just from getting from point A to B to, you know, finishing my sentence in a Google search query or, you know, telling me, Hey, you said I have an attachment, but I didn't attach anything in my email. Um, just the, or photos on my phone, um, but but imagine what it can do for analytics. Uh, that that's what I'm really excited about because um, I, I think we often talk about machine learning and the way you spoke about it, Minak. But AI has much greater opportunities, I think, to democratize analytics and and, and make it more accessible for um, for more marketers, brands to use to support their decisions. Um, and that's that's what I'm excited about in terms of what we can do with all this intelligence we're gathering um, is kind of make a make analytics much more accessible. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, the, my only point is that make sure we, you know, collect the right intelligence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
I'm a little more tempered in my enthusiasm, to be perfectly honest. I, uh, you know, I see a lot of the suggestions that Google Gmail comes up with, and I just think it's hilarious <laughs> if I were to, you know, it says, well, maybe you want to answer yes. Maybe you want to answer no. You have no idea what I'm thinking, you know? <laughs> That's not very helpful. Yes, I know. Yes and no are two options, That's but I don't know what the answer is. If you give it enough answers, it'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I... I uh, read at the beginning of last year, uh, Judea Pearl's book, The Book of Why. Book of Why, yeah. It's and I thought it was a fantastic book. And he, you know, I, I, I try to hold back on my whole spiel about experiments and, and all that. But he, you know, this is the guy who is, if I'm not mistaken, he invented, you know, I don't know, invented, but I mean, he had an important, he's, he's a critical AI computer uh, uh, science innovator and, and Bayesian networks for people who have heard of that, like this is the guy. And he has a quote in his book to the effect that, you know, exactly tempering enthusiasm for AI because especially around causal inference, because he says, I know how profoundly stupid the data are about mm. causality. And, yeah. And not just causality, like if, you know, we also know that algorithms can be biased and can bias in all sorts of ways, bias from a measurement standpoint, which is kind of where my focus on it is, but also bias in terms of social biases and other things, and partly in because maybe of incomplete data. Uh, so I, I don't pour cold water on everything you guys are talking about, but I don't, uh, I've got something to sell that's different, which is like, you know, to me, everything looks like a hypothesis and, uh, Maybe that does work. Let's check. But uh, we let's let's Stefan. Do you want to queue up uh, our question from our sponsor? Sure. Why not, Nancy? We have a curveball for you. This is a question from Ben Tata. Uh, he's the president of Standard Media Index, our sponsor this uh, this month. Uh, let's roll that. Uh, let's roll that question. Hi, Rick and Stefan. Congrats on the new podcast. Uh, my name is Ben Tata. I'm the president of Standard Media Index. And it's a real privilege to have the opportunity to present a question for your esteemed guests there. So the question I have for Minoc and Nancy is, with the increased focus and attention on attribution and outcome-based measurement, curious to get each of your perspectives on the extent to which outcomes get factored into buys and or the currency, and the extent to which we move beyond outcomes as a secondary guarantee. So thanks very much. All right. Who'd like to take that first? Nancy. Ladies first again. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's, I, I think, you know, it's a desire from marketers to, um, to want to have guaranteed outcomes uh, in terms of their, their buys. Uh, and, and I, do I see that as a possible future? Yes, I see that as a possible future. Do I see it factoring into currency? I think it can certainly factor into uh, higher costs if it can be proven. Um, and I am positive that there are uh, many that are looking to prove those outcomes to their advertisers. So I, I think that's absolutely a, a likely future. Um, Measurement, my son said many, many years ago, he loves math because you can get to the answer many different ways, but there's always one answer. Um, this space is a little bit unique as it's not always the same answer. And you know the math is, is quite different. So uh, that's gonna be the biggest challenge is having that common currency of how do you get to that outcome, especially in a, in a cookie deprecated world. Yeah, I've been asked this question before. Um, you know, I always go back, like, say, if you take 50 years back before you had digital, market was still, spend, you know, spending marketing dollars and there was an ROI and businesses have flourished, right? There was a real <laughs> profitable business for 100 years. So it's not that one-to-one -one marketing and outcome-based, you know, ROI transaction is driving businesses. So I think you have to take a look at historical perspective. That's first. And the second, I totally agree with um, with Nancy. And I, I feel like outcome always have been a factor in the total ROI. 
It's just that we now perhaps have better data, sometimes, not all the time, where you could tease that out. And uh, so I, I feel like the better we bring the measurement and outcome closer to each other or inform each other, I think it's going to be more in forefront of the decision making as, a, as opposed to not. But the fact that people think, well, measurement is one and outcome totally different, I don't think that's never been true. It's never been true historically. It's not true even today. And to Nancy's point, we have better data. We have Now we could bring this much, much closer and make it more real. Now, I do, I have to say, you know, in when it comes to measurement, I think people are basically mitigating the risks. So you, you are going for a larger swath of, you know, targets that you mitigate risk eventually. I'll give you an example. I was having this debate earlier this week uh, where when you look at the direct, you know, direct models where all you're trying to do is trying to improve the number in the numerator, right? So if you need 100 downloads, you could stuff your denominator with millions and millions of impression to get that 100 downloads. That's a very different model. <laughs> and it's very, it's workable, but different model. So I, I just feel like we just take either or, or there gotta be a you know, discussion and, and narrative where we should talk about this in, together in tandem. And I feel like we, we are getting to a place where especially with this one-to-one -one cookies going away, there might be a move to bring them closer in a holistic fashion. So I think it's an exciting time. Hmm. Reminds me of an insight that was shared with me by a guy who's left the industry a long time ago. Uh, and I don't know if any of you remember Richard Hoy and a list that preceded the wonks list and preceded the old timers list, which was uh, kind of an inspiration I have for the, the wonks, but the, the old timers list was so called the old timers because they wanted to differentiate from online ads. This earliest list in the late 90s by this guy Richard Hoy and Tanagra Marketing. And, uh, and there was just so many newbie questions. That's why the old timers set up. But he shared an insight with me once that he thought that you were always better off as a marketer buying on a CPM basis and on a performance basis, because then you could optimize yourself right? yep. at a fixed rate. And then you could, you know, figure out what moved the needle. Whereas if you just hand that over to the media company or some intermediary, you know, they may not have the same incentive or any optimization they can make. They basically arbitrage off of. Yeah, it's a math problem. Like, you know, math, you call it about global optimization and local. If you do local, you cannot get to global. Right. So you have to have broader reach to really fine tune your target. But that learning itself is so useful to run your business. If you're a marketer, is that going from global to local, that trend line is as important as anything. And I think that's when Nancy was talking about it may not be one to one outcome transaction. And that's one point is that there might be, you might be better off measuring on household outcomes or a store level than one-to-one. -one. <laughs> so it's not, you know, it's a very nuanced question and there are interesting possibilities here. I also think that's one of the great fallacies, you know, this one-to-one -one marketing idea. It's not like you're trying to chase after that love from middle school who got away and it's like one person that you're trying to get a message to. You're trying to get a message to cohorts of people, large cohorts of people who have characteristics that you care about. So Nancy, uh, you all just put out a document in uh, with the anniversary, your 20th anniversary of, uh, of 20 findings over those 20 years. Why don't you take us out with uh, one that comes to mind given our conversation today? Sure, sure, I'll, I'll send us off with the probably the most important uh, one that I, I find. Um, and <clears throat> it's to do with measurement and, and insights and the incredible power of buy-in for analytics across your organization to support decisions. Um, once you have cross-functional buy-in, that, wow, I've got great data, an analytic engine, and these wonderful insights to support my decision so I can better understand the risks and opportunities of my forward-looking plans, 
I have wonderful adoption and much stronger growth. In fact, we see five times the growth for those companies that adopt scenario planning and analytics to support their decisions. Um, it's been a wonderful 20 years. We have a, a wonderful team. I'm completely biased on that, um, but we have wonderful clients and, and wonderful partners and I'm um, delighted to have to be part of this industry because um, it is it is uh, it's never been dull. I've always been learning, and that's pretty that's pretty awesome. Yeah, never been dull are probably uh, no, truer words never spoken. Uh, <laughs> Nancy, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us today. And uh, Rick, do you want to take us out? Yeah, uh, I think I think you guys have said it great. This is just a, I think a perfect perfect example of what we're trying to accomplish with this podcast. Uh, really thoughtful conversation on some very important topics. Uh, you know, I would say about advertising that it's the workhorse of free speech. And it is also a true multiplier on, on business and a multiplier on the GDP. And I share your pride, you know, in working in this industry, honestly. Thanks. Well, Thank you, Rick. And a pleasure. Thank you guys for hosting. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.